Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of the Academy Show. I'm your host Mo Stewart and I'm joined as ever by our Academy expert as well as an expert on all other things as well, Matt Addison. Now we're getting towards the end of the season and there's not quite as much on the line for the young lads as there is for the senior side but there's still plenty of intrigue to come and maybe a little bit of silverware before the end of the season too. So we'll be discussing the results for the 18s and 23s as we always do. We've got to spend some time talking about that kid who just can't stop scoring as well and Matt has ever has his one to watch but First of all, I want to do an update from our show last time out, where we focused all our attention on Ben Doak. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a sad update, Matt. Uh, He was due to be heading out to the under-17 Euro Championships in Israel with the Scottish side, but he's picked up a little bit of a groin issue. Now, we don't know how serious it is, but the fact that he's missing this great tournament, it's a real shame for the lad, and for Scotland as well, because by all accounts, he was their great hope. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a shame, isn't it? Again, don't know exactly what the issue is, how long it's it's going to be. Hopefully, it's it's not too much of a, of a serious one because, like you say on the the last show, it was it was kind of a, an exciting insight, I think, into a, a player that Liverpool uh, are bringing in. Obviously, we've seen them do this a few times, as we've discussed on on previous editions of the show, and you know the the comparison to kind of a Mohamed Salah type player, a certain Shaqiri type player, I thought was was interesting as well, which. Those two kind of comparisons say to me he's very, very one-footed, likes to, to come in on the, the left foot. Um, but yeah, time time will tell. I'm sure, you know, next season we'll be able to, to have a bit more of a conversation around him. But yeah, it would have been nice to, to watch him, wouldn't it, in this tournament? But it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. That's the thing though, isn't it? Because we've had some time to sit and think about him and to imagine how we might turn out. So getting to see him in action would have been a perfect way to round that off. But we'll have to wait a little bit longer. Fingers crossed he's not out for too long. Now, another young lad who was already within the system, but who has signed an extension on his contract, another young striker, uh, Fidel O'Rourke. Now, do we know how long this extension is for, Matt? And also, he's moved up from the 18s to 23s over the course of this year. Do you think that he's going to get a full year with uh, Barry and his team in next season? Or is he maybe on, on, with a contract extension signed, is it maybe a precursor to him going out on loan? It, it, it's a really tough one to tell, to be honest. He's he's twenty years of age now, so he's he's at that point where you kind of think that possibly a permanent deal could have, have possibly been the way to go for him. The the new new contract is interesting. It, you wonder maybe is it a kind of valuation protection type thing? Is it just so that you can get a little bit of a fee for him? I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether they would get too much of a fee for him, to be honest. Anyway, um, he's not not been scoring that many goals, not been able to, to kind of establish himself really in the, the 23s, a bit more of a, a squad player, really nice lad. And I'm sure, you know, that there will be clubs who are, who are interested in him, but I don't think his, his future will be at Liverpool, despite the, the contract extension. Be interesting to see what happens. You, you say there, could he possibly go out on loan? I think that possibly could be, but then it's again a case of, of what level would that be at? I'm not too sure, you know, where where exactly that would be. It, it certainly wouldn't be a kind of championship or mm. or that kind of level. It it would be below that, I think. Um, so yeah, another another promising sort of um, sign in that Liverpool are making sure they've got kind of enough players in those age groups if they need them for next season. But it's um, it's one of those where I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with him in the summer. But I think probably for his career, it might be best for him to go out and, and go and play somewhere. But Again, it's it's not always that simple, is it? We've seen Paul Glatzel's had decent sort of times at times this season at Tranmere, but again, has has had a few a few kind of difficulties as well that that come with that 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 kind of thing. Probably might be the case for for Fidel next season, but yeah, the the new contract was interesting. Kind of came out of the blue a little bit, I think, for me. It's the age-old question, though, isn't it? It's uh, where it was best for their development to go away and play or to be within our system and maybe not play as much. And you wonder about where he sits within the pe- the pecking order of fours. I mean, over the course of the show, we're probably going to be talking about quite a few of them. And there is a lot of uh, highly regarded forwards in both the 18s and 23s. So you think about maybe the promotion of some of those guys. Maybe if one of those was to go out on loan, maybe this contract for Fidel is the idea of keeping him around, keeping the team going, ticking over sort of thing. But no, it's interesting the way you say, because I think for fans, particularly those who haven't heard his name on this show before, it's another new name. It's another strife to get potentially excited about, but 
we'll maybe watch this space, I think, when it comes to seeing what happens to Fidel over the course of the next season. Now, moving on to talking about the under-18s team, um, they have had some interesting results, I think it's fair to say, towards the end of the season. Uh, and their 10-3 victory over Leeds United caught the eye, I think it's fair to say. Uh, but in terms of the wider um, acknowledgement of their development and what we're really in it for with the 18s, I'd say the game at City was probably a more important gauge or one to talk about because obviously, as we've mentioned on previous shows, City are still the benchmark at this level. They are going to be the champions of this league, as it were. And the result, it looks like Liverpool were well beaten 3-1. They went down, but... I feel like to reading some of the reports and listening to some of the people speaking about the game afterwards, it was a game in which Liverpool competed for quite a lot of the game. They had their own chances, but they just couldn't take them. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair kind of summary, to be honest. I think there was there was a couple of chances for Mateusz Musielowski, obviously a name we've spoken about a few times on the show, a couple of, of chances for hopefully Cannoneer as well, who I know we're going to come on to very shortly. You'd probably would have imagined that he could have scored at least one of, of those chances that he had, but he didn't. It was Bobby Clark who, who actually got the goal in that one. Again, a really, really promising player, someone that I have liked to look at every time that I've seen. And obviously, the fact that he scored that goal, not sure how many he's up to now this season, but he's got, got a few since he's come in from Newcastle. And again, that's a really promising sign for him. So, yeah, it, it was a defeat for Liverpool. It, again, wasn't a particularly important one. It's it, It's not... You know, Liverpool were not going to be in kind of title contention. And even if they were in title contention, it, it wouldn't have particularly made too much of, of a difference to them. We know Manchester City, what they do, they're very much keen to, to win everything and anything really at that level. And they will drop players back down to the under 18s for the bigger games. They will do all of, of that sort of thing to make sure that they win the league. So it shouldn't be a massive shock, really, that City have, have won that. But yeah, for, for Liverpool, a decent performance, like you say, they've competed against a team which has got a lot of investment, has got a lot of, of good players in there. But I think the only thing that matters for Liverpool really is that you can kind of make the argument for one or two of their players coming into the Liverpool senior team at some point in the future. Bobby Clark probably is one of those that I would pick out as, as being a possibility. Whereas for Manchester City, yes, short term, they've won this game, but long term, can you see them being regulars? Probably not. Yeah. No, and again, I think it's, it highlights what you're really in it for. And sometimes we all believe that we're all teams are clearly in it for the same things, but then these kind of decisions tell you where their hearts lie. And I'm like you, I'm looking at the performances of a guy like Bobby Clark, and he's someone, again, who we've spoken about regularly over the course of the season throughout the show. And he seems to be a performer who's getting better and better with time. And you can really see the progress. And a pathway, which is the key difference between us and Manchester City. Yeah, I mean, Pep Linders, um, two or three months back now, suggested that Bobby could be one of those that goes on pre-season. And I think that there's definitely a strong case for, for that being the case, not least because Kay Gordon's had a bit of an injury. It doesn't look like he's going to play now for the rest of, of this season, which is a bit of a shame. He's not played for a few weeks. Even before that, he was kind of in and out a bit with a couple of little injuries. So, fingers crossed, that's kind of cleared up. But... You know, regardless of, of whether that is or, or not for pre-season, I think Bobby is in is in with a shout at the very least. I think he's obviously a player that England youth teams have, have got high hopes for and that's usually a pretty good sign. You look at some of the England players coming through over the last sort of two or three years, you think of even the ones that have been at Liverpool and, and have moved on, you know, there's there's been, you know, Rian Brewster and, and various others who've kind of been at that level where you can kind of see them going on and, and having, you know, careers at least in the championship, if not long term in the, the Premier League. So, yeah, th there's certainly a lot of, of excitement around him. Definitely want to, to keep your eye on in terms of, of pre season for the rest of, of this season as well. Maybe, maybe be uh, one or two opportunities for, you know, stepping up and, and training with the, the first team and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Bobby Clark, certainly the, the signs have been good. And he is, he's definitely, there's, there's probably sort of, three, four, five players that you look at across the course of, of the 18s and, and the 23s this season that you think have got, you know, a real genuine chance of, of being a first-team player for Liverpool. And I think, you know, Bobby Clark definitely is, is in that category. Yes, and that feels like a really nice segue into talking about Oakley Cannoneer because Oakley Cannoneer 
is making himself impossible to ignore. Now, we mentioned the 10-3 game against Leeds. He got four of them himself. He's currently sitting on a tally of 41 goals for the season, which is an incredible achievement. Yeah. Um, is it difficult for us to really calibrate 41 goals for the under-18s into a potential senior appearance? Is it hard to stop yourself getting too too far ahead? For me, I I still think there's a bit of a, a way to go with them. That sounds ridiculous when you see those numbers. <laughs> but I think I, I don't want to take too much away from him because obviously 41 goals across the, the course of a season is is incredible. That's, you know, across a, a variety of competitions, some kind of more competitive than others, I would suggest. Um, for me, the, the issue with him or let, let's say not the issue, but the kind of the next step for him is to be able to show that when he's stepped up to the under 23s, even when he stepped up into the UEFA Youth League, I think there's been a clear kind of sign really that he needs to, to still develop. Part of that is his development within his game and, and kind of becoming a little bit more kind of rounded. He's very much, you know, a goal scorer. I think there was there was a few signs early on in the season that he was dropping a little bit deeper and, and was able to kind of combine the play and, and kind of link the midfield to the attack a little bit more, which is obviously huge for, for Liverpool's first team. But I think generally across the course of the season, he's he's kind of been the one to, to finish the moves, but hasn't necessarily been involved all the way through, which I think is is an important next step. But the bigger thing for him really is just that he's, He's just a little bit small at the moment. And I know obviously that's you know not not always a barrier. That that is something that can be overcome. He's still still very young, so he can still kind of, of develop and, and move forward. And obviously the goals at under 18s level is is impressive. But for me, whenever he's he's tried to take that next step up, whether it's the youth league, the 23s, mm -hmm. he's just not quite looked so comfortable. So 41 goals, like I say, don't take anything away from him. Still, still a very, very young player with a lot of time to develop, both physically and in terms of, of kind of his development as a footballer mm. as well. But yeah, just just not quite ready, I don't think yet for for pre season and, and that kind of thing. It's it, it's a it's a really tough one because mm. in one way you can't really do much more, but then in in another way, I think there is still there is still a long way for him to go. It's it's a, it's an interesting conundrum for him as well, isn't it? Because you can look at it from two perspectives. Maybe he feels the pressure more when he rises up this level because he knows that there's more focus on the next step in his future. Or it could be that maybe with the younger guys, or like you say, some of the less competitive games, he just finds it a bit too easy sometimes when he's playing in those games. And so when he goes into the step up, it's harder to then switch on and apply yourself again. I mean, you've seen him a lot more than I have. Do you get a, a sense of which of those or if maybe something else which might be the key? I think for me, it, it boils down to the physicality, basically. He is still only 17. He didn't turn 18 until May. So he's one of those which he's kind of born in, in the time of the year where they do tend to be a little bit smaller. There's, there's not a kind of... Um, you know, a physical aspect to his game in the same way that you might look at someone like Billy Cometio, for example, and say, well, he's very much massive, big, strong, kind of looks maybe a little bit better than he is at certain times. His development has, has been okay this season, but I think he's massively helped by it. I think with, with Oakley, it's kind of the other way around. I think he needs mm -hmm. to, to bulk out a little bit. We've seen, I would say, particularly against sort of European teams in, in the youth league, he kind of gets a little bit lost in games at times. And I think you, you've got to have, you've got to have the physical attributes. You've mm -hmm. got to be in an absolutely elite athlete to be, you know, a, a Liverpool forward. You look at, at someone like Sadio Mane, who's not particularly the biggest physically, he's not the tallest, but very much is he's got that low center of gravity. You don't really see him being shrugged off the ball. You can see him kind of getting hold of the ball in, in tight situations and being able to yeah. keep hold of it. And even someone like Diogo Jota isn't particularly the biggest, but he's very, very good at finding that space and, and has used that to kind of, of get his way in terms of, of winning the ball in the air. So for me, it's it's more a physical thing than anything else. I just think he's he's not quite developed yet enough to, to kind of be in contention for senior level. But he's 17, coming up to 18. That That's not necessarily a bad thing. And I no. think if if that development physically comes in the next sort of 12, 18 months, then maybe we can have a, a discussion about a loan or, or possibility of, of going somewhere because 
there's clearly talent. You don't score 41 goals by accident, but I do still <laughs> think there's there's a there's a bit of a way to go before we can kind of think about senior football and, and taking that next step. Well, I mean, on the physiology side, there's only so much he can do. Although one thing I will say, it may have been a while ago, but I remember when I was 17, you could put a little bit of effort in and your body could change quite dramatically. So I suspect that he'll be working hard with the coaches over some kind of plan to not necessarily just bulk up, but strength. And as you said, the center of gravity. We mentioned that Diego Jota, another uh, young forward who comes to mind is Raheem Sterling. When he was coming through, he was he looked very slight, and yet he was still very strong. He was unable to be bumped off the ball very easily. So hopefully, people will be seeing him down, working through some of the old Raheem tactics, and we'll see a, a bigger, stronger Oakley ready to take on the world and the 23s next season. Speaking of the 23s, those boys seem to be ending the season in style. Uh, they enjoyed uh, a win over Manchester United at the weekend, something that's always pleasing to say, and it seems to be quite easy across the board this season. Um, it was nice for me to see uh, Rhys Williams getting himself a goal. He's obviously had a few appearances down in that team recent weeks, as we mentioned previously with Harvey Elliott, who's also played in the game against Leicester, I believe, but let's focus on Manchester United a little bit more. As I say, it's always nice to beat them. And yes, they did kind of make it easy for us as the senior side was. There was a kind of a comedy of goal to start off with. But as I say, it was a nice confidence booster for a team in form towards the end of the season. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's, it, it's a result which obviously Manchester United are not in the best shape at the moment, but it's still a derby. I'm sure, you know, Manchester United senior team made it very, very easy for Liverpool. But this was, you know, a little bit more of, of a battle, shall we say, between the, the two teams than that. It was it was certainly more competitive than that 4-0 that we saw at Anfield a few weeks ago. So yeah, it's it's still Manchester United. It's still obviously a big game for these players. Like I say as well, like just the, the fact that it's Manchester United adds a little bit of a pressure. I think, particularly at under twenty three level, I think there's there's always going to be one eye on on what that result is. Maybe it's it's a game that the result matters a little bit more and probably matters to to the players as well. I think if you're trying to make a bit of a name for yourself, someone like Reese Williams getting on the, the score sheet, for example, it's it's probably no no bad thing for them. So, yeah, it was a, a result which probably you would expect, I think, in terms of the, the kind of results this season generally. I know the, the two teams are are very, very close to the table, only only a point between them as it as it finishes. But from what I've seen of, of Manchester United at that level, I think that was was probably a fair result for Liverpool to, to leapfrog them and, and come into to fourth position. Looks like Liverpool probably are going to finish fourth in the, the table. I think Tottenham have got I think one, maybe two games in, in hand, so they could still leapfrog them and, and go back above them, but it looks like a a fourth place finish which again the, the kind of results and that kind of thing is is not the most important thing in the world but again Manchester City running away with it at the top West Ham and, and Arsenal in there as well I think in, in, in and around Liverpool so yeah a decent end to the to the season decent little result for them and Manchester United getting beat is, is never a bad thing. No, exactly. And I was always going to put it on the agenda, frankly, because the world <laughs> needs to know. <laughs> and, and I mean, we, we talk about Manchester United not being in the best place, but obviously in this game, there was Alejandro Garnacho, who just got his first uh, Premier League start recently. So they have got, obviously got some players who they, they have some hopes for, and we beat them. <laughs> now, um, some of the guys in our team who we've got high hope for, um, Leighton Clarkson and Tyler Morton, uh, two guys who've kind of come through together and have put up a little bit of a partnership in, in midfield over the course of the years. At the end of the season, though, it looks like that's probably going to come to an end, that little partnership. Um, I am interested in to see what you think the futures are for both lads. Do you think it could be one of them goes, one of them stays, a uh, permanent slash loan situation? It's a, it's a real tough one, isn't it? I think... For Leighton Clarkson, the time might have passed now for him to, to sort of make it as a as a senior player at Liverpool. I know we saw him in the Champions League for Liverpool against Michelin, I think, wasn't it, last season? Did pretty well in, in that game. I do like him, but it, it, it's kind of come to the point now where his loan in the first half of the season didn't particularly go well. 
wasn't necessarily his fault. It was just a Blackburn. The situation was completely different to what it was for Harvey Elliott the season before. Wasn't quite the situation I think that he thought he was going into. Probably wasn't the situation that Liverpool thought that they were sending him to. And you know, he, he grew up as as a Blackburn fan. I think he was he was kind of the obvious choice for Liverpool to send to Blackburn and, and try and replicate what they did with Harvey Elliott. But it it just didn't quite work out for him. And obviously, second half of the season has come back and has just basically played 23's football for mm. for the season. Has done well, you know, as much as, as you can. But I think there's still there's still a big gap between the under-23s and, and first-team senior football. And when you look at, at the number of players that there are in that area, I think Tyler Morton probably looks a slightly better prospect than him as well, which I think has, has pushed him a little bit further down the, the pecking order. So it wouldn't massively shock me if there was a transfer permanently for him somewhere. But Again, where is that? What level yeah. does he go in at? For me, last summer, it, it was the right thing to go and, and try and play in the, the championship. I think that was probably just about the right level. But you wonder now with the fact that it didn't particularly go well at Blackburn, will there be one or two championship clubs that maybe think it didn't go well there? Maybe it's it's not worth that gamble. Maybe he's kind of been a little bit unfortunate in that. But probably, yeah, for, for him, that might be the best way to go. I think at the very least, a loan deal. For Tyler, it's it's slightly different. I think, like I say, he's kind of he's bumped ahead of Leighton in terms of the the pecking order for the senior team. But is he going to get loads of football at Liverpool at senior level next season? Probably not. You look at someone like James Milner now; he might stay. You know, might be, you know, one or two others in there. Fingers crossed. Naby Keita and Thiago stay fit. There's just so many options in that area. It's a little bit difficult for him. So. Maybe there's a loan deal for him, but again, you've got to get that right. Where yeah. where would it be that he goes? I think if if someone like, say, Norwich wasn't so far away and wasn't such a pain to get to, that might be ideal for him. That kind of team that you know is is going to be competing at the top end of the championship, is going to play football, is going to try and, and pass. That that sort of thing might be useful, but yeah, the yeah, the actual physical location of Norwich probably isn't the easiest. At least Blackburn was was just kind of half an hour up the road, whereas Norwich is a, is a little bit more difficult to get to. Well, so, I mean, they've, they've, yeah. they've got the Norwich player now, so they can still keep an eye on him for the comfort of Liverpool if need be. But an interesting option for me, though, bearing in mind some of what we were saying to Owen last week, is Scotland. Because I think if you look at the SPL, they are currently in a dearth or facing a dearth of young talent because their better players at a younger age are coming through into our system. So maybe there's some kind of filter where we can say the players who are at a higher level may be looking for a little bit more regular football and send them back to the SPL. Because, yes, it's the top league in Scotland, but also if you're looking at some of the better teams, there might be European football available for them. I think of the connection that Liverpool have had with Rangers in recent years, not in just Ryan Ken, but via Jari and stuff, etc., I think there might be, again, a, a pathway for for our boys to go back over into Scotland. Yeah, that's a really good shout. Actually, it's it's not something I thought about, but I think that is that's that's definitely got to be an option. Even for for Leighton Clarkson, to be honest, you'd look at and think that he could go there and and do do a decent job. You know, you you look at Ryan Kent when he was at, at Liverpool. There wasn't there wasn't really much chance of him making it at Liverpool long term. I think you know Leighton Clarkson certainly at certain points during his Liverpool career so far in the last couple of years has been you know, way ahead of, of what Ryan Kent ever was. And you look at, at the kind of form that, that he'd shown since he's gone to Scotland has, has really blossomed and, and become a really good player. So I think it is a, a really good platform. And yeah, the, the, the ability, I think, if you're going to send out Tyler Morton on loan, for example, you want them to be playing in a team where you know that they're competing. You know that there's that pressure to win every week. I think if you go to the championship and it's kind of a, a mid-table team, it's it, it can be a little bit difficult to kind of replicate what you're going to get at Liverpool. Whereas if you're at Rangers, you've got the big crowd, you've got that pressure, you're probably going to be competing with Celtic for a title. I think that could make a could make a lot of sense for them. But uh, yeah, we, we'll see on, on both of them. It wouldn't massively surprise me if Tyler stayed at, at Liverpool next season. But mm. I think... Um, with a lot of these things, it's kind of up to the player to a certain extent. Liverpool didn't particularly want to send Harvey Elliott out, for example, but he kind of pushed yeah. for it. And in the end, it, it happened. So, yeah, th there are lots of options available for them. But, yeah, hopefully, hopefully Tyler Morton can uh, can stay fit and, and make the right decision next season because he's a, he's a player I, I do really like watching. 
we'll have to watch the space on both of them. But before we get too fully into next season, there is still one more game for them this year, the Lancashire Senior Cup Final against Burnley. Now, some people may not necessarily know the history of this competition, but it is one with some prestige at this level, and it will be a trophy Liverpool will be trying to win as we try to win every single trophy we, we're in for. Yeah, exactly. And I think the fact that it is a trophy, it's it's a rare kind of opportunity really at that level to have a bit of pressure. I think the fact that it's a cup final, it's it's not a cup final that most people will have ever watched before or possibly even heard of, but it's a cup final. So, you know, there will be eyes and, and ears looking out for, for the results and, and for people like us to, to talk about it. So there will be a little bit of a, a pressure kind of situation, which I think is is no bad thing. I think it's something that you know, I've spoken to, to Barry Lutus in particular in the past about trying to trying to sort of create those situations artificially for, for Liverpool. You can't necessarily have it week in, week out, but you can set players certain challenges within certain games, or you can try and you know put certain players under certain pressures to, to do different things within games to try and, and kind of help the development without necessarily having that pressure in reality. And I think the fact that there is a bit of pressure on this one, the fact that it's, it's a cup final, it's, it, it's a bit of an opportunity to have that and not really kind of have to, to artificially generate it. There will just automatically be you know, people watching out for it. The players will, will take it seriously. So, yeah, one to, to watch out for and a nice little nice little end to the season for them. It's it, It's been a nice year, but it's always nice to, to kind of cap that with a little bit of silverware. I think so. And it would be a nice habit to run it all through the Liverpool side. Collecting silverware is what we do as a trophy, as a club, and we can shout it from the rooftops at every level. That's the plan. Now, before we leave, Matt, we have, as is traditional, your one to watch to come up with. So, as I say, we've spoken about a lot of people over the course of the show. Is there still anyone out there that's still under the radar? Well, it's it's a player that people will have heard of this week, but it's a player who's only just come back from an injury, and I think it was uh, it was right for us to mention him at, at some point. And and it's Leighton Stewart. It's uh, a player that we spoke a little bit about on the last show, I think, and. Obviously, he's come back after like 14, 15 months with a cruciate injury. He is back now. He's he's made three games since his comeback. Came off the bench for, I think, 25, 30 minutes against West Ham. Then has started against Leicester, where he scored, and, and started against Manchester United as well. So, I suppose he's he's one to watch in, in a couple of different ways, really. One is, how does that sort of continue in terms of, of pre-season and setting himself up for, hopefully, an injury-free season next season? But also, he's he's kind of 19 now. When he, he first got injured, I think he was 17, nearly 18. And you're kind of thinking of those players, you've got a big 18 months ahead of you. Unfortunately for, for him, the majority of that period was spent on the sidelines, frustrated, injured. So he's 19 now. It's it's kind of a question, really, of, of what comes next, what happens next for him. And I don't know. I'll, I'll be uh, certainly keeping my fingers crossed for him. I think it's, it's very, very difficult. I think Paul Glatzel is, is the example you need, really, of kind of getting injured at the wrong time really does hamper you and he's kind of struggled as he alluded to before in terms of, uh, of being a, a tramier this season so it can go one or two ways really for, for Leighton but you know top top player top lad top prospect hopefully uh hopefully he can stay injury free for, for the next few months and, and sort of see where he's at really I think yeah for him it'll be a case of, of probably staying at Liverpool next season establishing himself for, for the 23s and Maybe if he can stay fit until, say, Christmas, maybe the second half of, of next season could go out on loan. But yeah, he's he, he's been so unfortunate. I think he's he's one to watch just as much as anything else because you've just got your fingers fingers crossed for him. Hopefully, just praying that he can stay fit and, and get a bit of luck. Because uh, yeah, I know th th there was a lot of excitement before his injury, and with the kind of clamour for the next big thing, there's always a new name on the mm. on the uh, the lips of, of fans. So. Yeah, just one basically that I wanted to, to point out. He's made his comeback, really good prospect, and, and fingers crossed he can stay fit. Yeah, and it's a nice feel-good story, I think, as well. for Because as you say, he was highly rated. And an injury of that ilk at this stage in your career, can, we've seen it be fatal so many times. So just to see him with a chance to get his career back on track, it's a nice feel-good factor. And also, considering we're talking about a player coming back from an injury, it's a nice bit of symmetry to end the show, considering where we started with Ben Doak. So see that, Matt? All wrapped up in a nice little bundle. Thank you, as ever. I'm sure we've got one more of these before the season's end. I'll join you for that. All you out there listening, we'll see.